and screen share, and I'm gonna go here, and I'm gonna go here. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so continuing on uh, our introduction to hurricanes. Um, mm -mm -mm. So as we just said, uh, cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, all the same thing. And it's essentially a matter of intensity or a matter of degree to go from tropical depression to storm to hurricane to major hurricane. So these are the, these are the scales of, or excuse me, these are the categories of hurricanes. Now this is, uh, this is the Sapphire Simpson scale. This is what we've been using for um, decades now. Um, there is movement to create, to, to move to a different um, rating of hurricane intensity, but for now, this is what we're using. So, uh, uh, okay, first I'll describe it and then I'll, then I'll talk about the history of it. Okay, so, so again, uh, going from the left is the least uh, strong storm to the right, the most strong storm. And so um, ba it's basically based on wind speed, right? So there's also some associated storm surge, but the storm surge is predicted, right? So wind speed is really what we measure and say if it's a category two or four or what have you. Um, now, if we look at this, it looks a little bit funky, right? So 74 to 95, like why? Why not 73? Why not 72? Or you know why 100? Why not 110? Why 111? Right? These these kinds of things. Um, any any guesses? Any guesses as to where we got these categories from? Anybody have any thoughts? Was it from pre-existing hurricanes that we've uh, measured? Absolutely. Yep. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, so this basically came from any any other guesses? So Joe's basically right. So this came from folks um, in the disaster response industry, Red Cross, et cetera. So f entities like the Red Cross were um, so so we typically think about uh, you know disaster assistance as folks bring in water and uh, you know doctors with with mobile labs or or. Um, uh, National Guard or Army or whatever, sort of evacuating people. And those are all obviously super important. Maybe some utility guys in there, you know, turning off the gas or, or something of that nature. Um, but another really key part of disaster response, especially for large scale disaster response, are engineers, are, are, are structural experts, infrastructure experts. So when we have an event, earthquake, hurricane, what have you. Um, not so much with wildfires, but more for these uh, earthquakey, hurricane-y type events, tornado-y type events. First thing these, these organizations do, these nonprofits, send in the engineers. And so they do a reconnoitering. So they could be flying around in helicopters. Increasingly now we use drones, but, but they're, they're, they're and, and then walking around the, the infrastructure. So they're looking, they're checking out. They're saying, oh my God, what's going on? Are people here going to need some tarps to cover their roofs and 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 make their roof uh, not leaking, or are is the, are the buildings gone and we need to provide tents for folks, right? That, like that kind of thing. That's a huge decision. So in the in the first hours, days after these disasters, that assessment, that looking at the 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 state on the ground is really really key, and then informs how the response is going to roll out, right? And so this was this is primarily from these these folks that are working in in uh, Latin America, and they're they're visiting all these um, uh, places, and, and they're 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 finding it hard to predict exactly what they're going to need for aid in the wake of the hurricane. And so essentially, these guys get together and they say, well, you know, wind seems to cause a lot of damage to particularly to single family homes and 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 residences and things of that nature. And so, so let's see if we can start adding up like what, the damage that we saw in area one and what we know of the measured wind speed in that area. So after a bunch of messing around, this is what we get. And so we, we got this um, ranking, which is based on a typical destruction to typical infrastructure in the, you know, turn of, in, in last, in the, over the last century. Okay, so 
So that's why we get these, these strange breaks of 95 to 96 and 110 to 111 and, 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 and so on and so forth. So the wind speeds here are, are particularly calibrated to the type of structural damage to things like roofs and windows and things of that nature. So category one, um, not, not a huge deal, right? In, in terms of the, the response. It could be huge if your home is, is, happens to be hurt, but on average, not, not a huge community-wide response. When we get to uh, category two, this is where we're starting to see some significant impacts, but still not hugely everybody everywhere. Um, and then as we get to category three, we're starting to see much more consistent damage to different uh, houses and significant, usually, dumping of rain inland, and so associated inland flooding, whereas the, the, the first couple categories are primarily associated with storm surge and, 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 and flooding on the immediate shoreline area. Uh, category four, lots of problems, problems everywhere, and everybody needs to have gotten out of there. You probably need to get out of there in category three, but definitely by category four, we need to have evacuated everybody beforehand. Category five is people are just dead. People are going to be dying in large numbers. And um, basically very few structures that aren't specifically engineered and hardened to deal with hurricanes are going to survive unscathed. Um, so so that, 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 that's where we get our current uh, category. Um, just as a quick note, the issues now uh, or, or, the, or the debate as to how we might modify uh, categories of hurricanes um, now are, are um, recognizing that, again, from the disaster recovery you know, response to the impact uh, perspective, scale. We're starting to see larger and larger and more consistently large scale hurricanes. And so there's, there's interest now in not just tying the, the rating to the wind speed, but to also tie it to the size Although we're not, we haven't officially left this scale yet, but there's there's burblings that we need to incorporate that as well because a very intense hurricane, but that's it, relatively small, is going to impact that city, let's say. Whereas a similarly intense hurricane, but that's much larger, could impact, say, the whole state or multiple states or something of that nature, and obviously will require a much greater um, scale of response. Okay, so a couple examples of, of like what are the biggest hurricanes that we've measured. Um, the first one, Typhoon Nancy in 1961 in the Pacific um, has the strongest to date, at least the strongest ever measured sustained winds, 213 miles per hour. This is a little controversial because some people say, oh, there's some error with their measurements. But for now, at least officially, this is the record of 213 miles per hour. There's no way you're surviving 213 miles per hour out, outside. Um, a, a piece of paper here could cut you open, right? Flying at that speed. It, it's, it's, you can't even come close to standing up. Trees can't even come close to not snapping. Um, it, it's just, a, a there's no way to survive that except to not be there, really. Um, as we'll talk about in a, in a moment, um, Key to this, or another key measurement, is the uh, how low the pressure is, and that has to do with the sucking in of wind. But um, this was uh, pretty low uh, pressure. Um, typh it's, that's Typhoon Nancy, the, the 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 strongest winds recorded, and then the largest in terms of spatial scale. The largest typhoon is Typhoon Tip from 1979 that that struck the Philippines. And uh, this guy also had incredibly strong winds. Is 190 miles per hour really that different than 213? Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we could, I couldn't probably perceive it. Again, 190 miles per hour, you, you, you will be dead if you're out and about. If you're not um, blown over or blown into something, very quickly debris that will be mobilized in the wind will strike you and most almost assuredly kill you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this guy was more than 2,000 kilometers wide, massive scale. So um, Nancy's the, the windiest, uh, tip is the biggest that we've seen um, so far. Because one of the things I, I, people always ask when we start going, this is, what, what is the 
strongest hurricane, et cetera. So, and of course, we could then go in and put the deadliest, the costliest, et cetera. But, but for the introduction to hurricanes, these are the two ones I'd like to start with. Okay, now to understand uh, the, the next little bit about hurricanes, we need to understand the Coriolis force. So what are we doing right now? So we're looking down at a, um, I, have a I have a historic graphic I usually show, but it looks a little pixelated when I was looking at it earlier today. So I just grabbed this other alternative one. What are we looking at? We're look, imagine we're looking down on a merry-go-round, okay? And, um, and this is the Coriolis effect or the Coriolis force. The Coriolis isn't a real force. Coriolis is a so-called apparent force. So in our day-to-day -day interactions, it seems like it is a force of nature, but in reality, it's, uh, it's a consequence of our perspective. So what am I talking about? Okay, so here's this merry-go-round spinning around, okay? And uh, we have this gun with a, with, a, with a Nerf ball, let's say, okay? And we bang, we shot the Nerf ball. So check it out. The Nerf ball is traveling on this blue trajectory. It's traveling in a straight line. We shot the ball out. We applied force. That ball is accelerating through the atmosphere, and it's it's going in a straight line. Okay. If you and I, though, are are sitting on the spinning merry-go-round, okay. So if we're one of the yellow lines here, and we're looking at that ball, it has the effect of looking like it's it's the the course over which that ball traces over the merry-go-round looks like it curves, right? And so the problem is you and I are on a merry-go-round. The earth is spinning. So when we, when we look at the consequences of water moving, air masses moving, et cetera, it appear, they appear to deflect. They appear to bend. And that is, that is the Coriolis force. Does that make sense? You guys, that, that, that makes sense from intro environmental science or your intro physics? Yeah? Okay, so this is, everybody's confused. Perfectly, excellent, perfect, excellent. So um, that's essentially why we have these bands of winds in these different cells. This is an idealized diagram. Things are more messy than this, but in large picture, this is what's going on. So as a consequence, we get um, these different uh, 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 air moving in different patterns, right? And so this is where we get the terms the westerlies, the trade winds, et cetera, from back in the days when um, the economics depended on shipping and depended on sales. So, so we really knew how uh, sales caught the wind. And so, so this was super important to uh, uh, the movement of goods and services and things around the planet. This is also important for hurricanes. So let's talk about the structure of, okay, so, so a hurricane. So a hurricane is a spinning thing. It's a cyclonic structure. Talk about more of, of how we, uh, our, our recipe to get hurricanes in a second, but just to make sure um, we're all conceptually the same page, we're looking at a big giant spinning vortex, okay? And so um, what's going on here is we have uh, uh, warm ocean water, this warm ocean water is making warm air. So moist, warm air. This moist, warm air is rising, okay? And this rising air right here, this rising air is reducing uh, air pressure, creating a void, essentially. Uh, cold, denser air is rushing in to fill the void. And if all the, we'll talk about it in a second, but if all the mm, components are right and all the recipe is, is put together correctly, they'll start feeding on each other and this will grow and grow and grow in strength. And so we get this, this, so the spinning of the storm is actually air trying to equalize, is, is this, this disequilibrium attempting to come into equilibrium. And as it gets stronger and stronger, and as and I mentioned a minute ago, the, the air pressure, as the pressure gets lower and lower, 
there's more and more uh, uh, air, is, or air is rushing in faster and faster to try to plug in that quote unquote missing air. And so we get this structure that looks like this. So we get um, uh, usually these sort of anvil-like structures and they are spinning and spinning and spinning and we get this uh, uh, um, warm air rising, spin, 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 spin. And then in the center, we get this uh, cold air sinking. The other, okay, so this is the this is the air part of it. This is what's going on in the atmosphere. As we're as the the storm is moving around and 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 it's, it's not in one place, right? It 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 moves through space. So as it's moving through space, quicker or slower, this spinning of the the air mass also creates friction on the surface of the ocean and tends to pile up, kind of kind of you know lump up water. And so that lumping up of the water is what we refer to as the storm surge, right? So, so this might be the, the, the typical range, let's say, of our tidal, um, tidal condition. But what's going to happen is this water is going to be lumped on top of already whatever the tide is, and it's going to tend to push it up higher. And so, so in this case, this is, these are arbitrary numbers. This is just an example. But so both, it'll, it'll pile up high, and then as a consequence, it's going gonna, it's gonna to uh, a flow forward, right? So the areas that typically don't get inundated are now going to be inundated. And depending on how fast the storm is going to go, this is going to be out in front of the storm for some time, right? So this, if it's a slow moving storm, the storm surge can, if it's a fast moving storm, might be a couple hours the, the storm surge goes up and then the storm blasts past, right? Or if it's a relatively contained storm. If it's a, if it's a very large system and if it's slow moving, the, the water can go up and stay up for hours and hours or possibly even days. Um, so hugely problematic. So again, it's not a wave breaking over you. It's as if the lake now rose above the boat. So let's look at some, uh, some examples of some of the storm surge from a Hurricane Katrina. So let me click this and click this. At Discover, we match all the cash back you earned at the end of your. Who cares about that? Okay, so let's have a look at this uh, this compilation of. We'll just skip around here for a second, but to look at some of the storm surge and make sure we're all on the same page. So this is, I believe, this is Alabama or Mississippi. I can't remember. I think it might, it might be Mississippi. Anyway, so uh, so this is right, typically terrestrial land, and check it out. Right, so the water is just over. This is the start of. Um, this is Hurricane Katrina still offshore. Again, you see the waves starting to break over and then they just don't really go away. So as we go through time, they just keep getting deeper and deeper and higher and higher. Okay, so here's somebody's house, right? So here's the water up to the window in the house, right, initially. And, uh, and now it's starting to leak inside the house. Uh, and this, this is water that's just, again, we're still hours away from the main landfall. Uh, here's the water coming up to this guy's door. Here's inside a house, right? After several hours of this. Uh, here's uh, uh, another, another half hour or so. And now we're starting to see vehicles floating and vehicles starting to, to um, bang into structures. Uh, now we're starting to see vehicles float indoors. Um, and now uh, if you're on the first floor, you are in danger of drowning, right? So you need to get to higher um, ground. Now one of the challenges in poorly constructed buildings is as you go higher, you start to be exposed to wind, right? So, so the higher we go up, the, the, the more we're in the, the force of the wind. And so if you go up in the top of a building, you could get struck by the wind. If you're on the bottom, you could be inundated with storm surge. So these guys are on the second floor and the water is coming up to the second floor. Oops, sorry. Are these videos just from people that didn't evacuate? Correct. So now it's coming up the um, 
the uh, the stairwell. Now there's about an, about an hour or so later. Now there's debris floating up, and now you can see the the water is all the way up to the top of the second level. Again, consistently, all right. This is this is this is hours now that we're experiencing this. So this is not a wave that's smacking us. This is your drywalls getting wet. Your your paintings are getting wet. Your 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 um, marriage license is getting wet. Everything is is inundated. Uh, yeah. And this is uh, what it was like on the top of the second floor. And, uh, and it's just crazy, right? So now, now, and so one of the big problems with, with, these, with these situations is when people don't evacuate or oftentimes can't evacuate, now, now you're stuck. Now you realize, oh my God, maybe I'm going to drown in here. I want to get out. But at this point, it's too late, right? This is what it looks like outside if you were to try to, you know, evacuate to somewhere else. That's, you know, you're going to get whacked by debris, going to get drowned by these waves, going to get thrown onto some jagged sign or whatever. So this is a extremely difficult to survive situation. And so again, the safest thing when we have these major hurricanes is to not be there. That's the best. Uh, possible thing. Okay. Does it say if that dude was okay? Uh, that that dude, yes, that that dude was okay. okay Correct. Cool. Um, but many other people were not. Um, yeah, and, and I have some I have some crazy video. If you guys um, come with us to New Orleans next year, I I, I have this one crazy video that uh, these fishermen made. So the the highest um, recorded. Um, storm surge in Louisiana during Katrina was at this place uh, where we were called Burris and, and, you know, insane, you know, more than 20 feet high and just crazy. And these, <laughs> these crazy shrimp boat guys stayed on their boat. And so they had a VHS recorder and they recorded some of the stuff. And it's just, you can't believe these people survived. Um, so yeah, so when we do have these videos, Mostly it's from the few folks that did uh, survive because the cell phone networks are down. It's very hard for even weather, uh, uh, you know, professional television folks to transmit signals and stuff. So it's usually when we get these videos are from people that, that did, were lucky enough to uh, survive the situation. Okay, let's talk about how we get our hurricanes. So these, this, is, this is my recipe for, uh, I didn't come up with it. I shouldn't say it's mine, but but this is the recipe for getting a hurricane. So first, we need, um, and we have to have all these conditions met. If any one of these conditions uh, is not met, we're not going to get a hurricane. So first and foremost, we need a warm ocean. So the folks at the National Hurricane Center define that as uh, surface water uh, uh, greater than 26.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, greater than or at, at least 50 meters deep. So we're not talking about a little teeny thin lit layer of hot water. We're talking about a, a pretty significant mass of water. This warm water will form the fuel. Hurricanes do not form in the polar regions. They need warm water. Next, the analogy here is if, if we're thinking about a fire, um, we wanted to start a fire. Um, it's easier oftentimes to start a fire in a fireplace, right? Or when you're trying to start a fire and you're out camping, a lot of times you sort of cup your hands around the twigs or put a windbreak to, as you're starting to get it going, right? Otherwise, it, when you're first bringing that match to the, to the fuel, it, it, it blows out and it can't, can't get going. So we need a, an equivalent of a fireplace. And that is a fast cooling atmosphere. So as we go higher, higher, it, there, there's a rapidly cooling um, uh, temperature shift. So that's going to mean this warm, moist water right there is going to is going to be able to cool and condense and turn into clouds and in, in, in water vapor or uh, um, water. Okay. Uh, so got the fuel, got the fireplace. Then we need more fuel, which can be the mid troposphere. That's five kilometers up. We want it to be wet um, uh, for for heat transfer and energy transfer and stuff. Next, um, hurricanes, I just said hurricanes don't form at the poles because it's too cold, the water's too cold. They also do not form at the equator. So they have to, they have to start 
more than 500 kilometers from the equator. And this has to do with, with the ability of, these, of the winds to effectively curve, right? The effect of the apparent force of Coriolis. Um, so can't be right at the equator, can't be right at the poles. And then we need some disturbance. This is where there's some of the most active research right now. We don't fully understand it, but some of the um, typical examples that people talk about are dust blowing off the Saharan desert. Um, uh, there's some re recent work people say maybe it has to do with bacteria, airborne bacteria and stuff, but, but suffice it to say there needs to be some little spark that gets us going um, and some atmospheric disturbance. So we have all this fuel, we have the fireplace, we're, we're in a place where the Coriolis effect can help us make the, the spinning. Then we get that spark, that dust storm from, from Africa or whatever. Uh, and then we have to have no vertical shear. So we have to have the high, high elevation winds as we're forming. Once the hurricane gets going, it's, it's gonna make its own wind. But when we're forming it, we can't have a windy condition. So still conditions help the formation of a hurricane. And if it's super windy, just, just as the hurricane's starting to form, that wind's gonna come in and, 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 and disturb it and not allow that cyclogenesis to, to happen. And so that's defined, the hurricane center defines that as less than 37, um, wind shear is less than 37 kilometers per hour. Okay, so let's talk about uh, how this manifests. And here's an example of the year that we had Hurricane Katrina. So uh, as we've mentioned with other weather patterns, drought, et cetera, there are different uh, uh, cycles, different uh, signals, periodicities. And um, when we were coming up to Hurricane Katrina, we, we're experiencing an active period of um, hurricanes. So we always have hurricanes every year, whether we're talking about the Pacific or in the Atlantic, as in this case, the Atlantic hurricane season, um, we're always gonna have hurricanes. But some years we have more, some years we have less. Okay, so coming up to this era of 2005, um, we were in a period of elevated um, uh, hurricane activity. And it had been elevated for about a decade. The only time we weren't seeing um, uh, elevated frequency of hurricane occurrence was during the El Ninos of 97 and 2002. We mentioned before how El Ninos have strong effects on drought, et cetera. They can also impact, again, having to do with um, a wind shear and things of that nature. They can have strong impacts on hurricanes. In the case of the Atlantic, hurricane season, which we're talking about here in this example, in the Atlantic hurricane season, El Nino seasons, or El Ninos tend to act to, to dampen um, hurricane activity. The other thing we had was we had above average Atlantic sea surface temperature. So the ocean was, the surface of the ocean, especially in the area where, you know, the kind of the Gulf and that area of, of prime hurricane activity, it was warmer than a, a traditional year on average. And then thirdly, we had favorable winds and air pressure were all leading. So what that led to was conditions that were predicted to be 175% um, above so-called hyperactive seasonal baseline. So there's two entities. There's the National Hurricane Center and the National Center for uh, uh, Atmospheric Research in, in, um, in Colorado. So these two entities in the US are the ones that issue hurricane predictions every year. And they'll come out before, and so hurricane season, I, sh, I don't think I put a slide in here, I think I screwed this up. Uh, June to November is our hurricane season, is our traditional Atlantic hurricane season, and essentially the same for the Pacific, uh, or, 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 or excuse me, for, for Baja and in that part of the Pacific it flips, so it's, it's the inverse for Australia in the Southern Hemisphere. Anyway, so in, in the months before the season starts, the modelers release their predictions for the year. And they say, ah, oh, we predict we're gonna have X number of hurricanes and X number of major hurricanes, et cetera. And so already in 2005, 
um, or, or excuse me, at, at, the, at the start of 2005, the modelers were predicting a super crazy, insanely abundant hurricane season, 175% above hyperactive. What the heck does that mean? I have no idea. Let's look at it. So here we go. This is an example that we'll get every year for the, for the hurricane forecast folks. Again, we in California don't tend to pay attention to this. We're more interested in atmospheric river predictions and El Nino and wildfire predictions, but this is um, a key thing. So here we go. Note, we have a prediction for tropical storms, a prediction for hurricanes, and a prediction for major hurricanes. Again, uh, uh, strong on the left to stronger in the middle to strongest on the right, okay? And for, in the, in the lead up to Katrina, this is uh, uh, since 1950 to that season, we have the average number of tropical storms per year and the range, okay? And so, so this, is, this is our guide. So a, a near normal, a normal or near normal, again, um, as we mentioned with droughts and, and water supply, the notion of mean is problematic because the system is so noisy. They're, they're oftentimes, we, we rarely, if ever, have a mean year, right? We have wet years, dry years, uh, intense years, uh, less intense years, but, but we don't usually hit the, the mean. But, but the range is perhaps more useful in this case, in a lot of these climactic weather-related cases. So here we go. But nevertheless, to give us a sense, you know, Somewhere on the order of, of nine-ish, six to 14 tropical storms was, is about historically normal. About six or so hurricanes, again, that would be category one or category two. And then about two major hurricanes. And this would be um, that make uh, uh, you know, landfall. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, that make landfall in the Gulf Coast or on the Eastern Seaboard of the United States. So there we go. So typical is a couple, a couple big hurricanes, you know, half a dozen hurricanes and, you know, about 10 or so um, tropical, named tropical storms. An above normal season would be uh, uh, more than that. So instead of six to 14, we're talking about 10 to 20-ish. Instead of four to eight, we're talking about six to 12 hurricanes. And instead of, you know, one or two or three, we're talking about two to eight hurricanes. So this was the condition for 2005. They were predicting 28 tropical storms, or sorry, excuse me, excuse me, the prediction was 18 to 21. We ended up getting 28. The prediction was nine to 11 hurricanes. We ended up getting 15 and major hurricanes was predicted to be from five to seven, we ended up getting seven. So the warning system has gotten, has gotten much better, right? We can always be improving, we can always be get, getting better, but compared to the Galveston situation, right? Compared to those previous situations, this is, this is night and day, right? We're, we're, we're fantastic in that we have satellite data, we fly airplanes into the hurricanes as they're occurring so we can get direct measurements of the, uh, intensity and other aspects, and we feed these into massive models. We have many models that we run, so we've gotten a lot better at this. And so, when so, now we wish we had this for earthquakes, right? We wish we could say, "Oh my gosh, we're going to have you know." Here's when the earthquake is happening. We're not there with earthquakes yet, but with hurricanes, we've gotten quite good at um, at estimating the magnitude and the frequency of these events. Um, and so this is the situation again in, in 2000, using the example of Katrina. And so here we can see this is sea surface temperature, and these are anomalies. So again, the hotter uh, the, the color here, uh, uh, the warmer the water. So this is average temperature, and this is anomalies. So the average temperature, look how hot this is. So, so these hurricanes, again, are going to come off of Africa or start, you know, dust help sort of start them, start off around here about <coughs> 60 to 70 percent of our Atlantic hurricanes are so-called uh, Cape Verde hurricanes, meaning they start in and around the Cape Verde Islands, you know, sort of from this African part of the basin. 
So they kind of start over here and they come our direction. So they blow our way. And um, this is exactly what you would like to not see, right? So they start over here, but as it gets closer and closer, the water, the fuel is getting warmer and warmer, more and more fuel. And then the anomalies are the difference from a typical year, right? So this is, this is the average conditions here as we're the week of August 24th. This is just in the immediate um, preceding period for Hurricane Katrina that hits at the end of August. Uh, and the, but they look at the anomalies. Anomalies are, are, are disproportionately warm even compared to normal. And so we have these areas right where we don't want them, which is just when they're making landfall, very, very warm. And then the other thing, the other uh, key part here that we mentioned was uh, less wind. And so this is, this is the uh, vertical wind shear and check it out. So again, red here in this case means deviation. So red means slower wind. So now as, as these hurricanes sort of come this away, so white is, is average, but as we, they come this away, um, we're getting less windy. So we're more conducive to the formation and or the early stage creation of hurricanes. So this was just really um, not good news for uh, what was going on. Okay, so once we have all those things and once a hurricane, a tropical storm starts to form, then what do we do? How are we doing on time? Are we okay with time wise? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so the, the next thing we'll, we'll see is to, as far as you and I, and as far as a disaster context is predictions. So how do we predict what's gonna happen? So, so now we understand how it's gonna happen. We have some of these early season predictions so that folks can start to get ready for planning for evacuation, planning for contingency, uh, you know, stashing of supplies or something of that nature. So that's really key to, to get people uh, uh, primed for potential problems. Now, um, as it's coming closer, people want to know, is it coming? And so these are the so-called spaghetti models or spaghetti diagrams. Each of these different, so this is the predicted path of, uh, in this case, Hurricane Dory, of the prospective hurricane. So this is when the model is generated, or this is the point in time we're talking about. And the models are running it through se <clears throat> several days into the future. We have different models or different models or the same model parameterized with slightly different um, conditions. And this is what we get. So we get the models predicting stuff. And so some of the models, check it out, some of the models are pretty tight, right? So a lot of them are suggesting in this case, that it's gonna come up it's going to uh, 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 go hit sort of central Florida, and then it's going to turn and go up the, the Carolina, the Carolina coast, right? We do, though, have a few other models. This guy's like, what? I'm going to go up here and hang out over here. This one is like, well, I'm going to go check out Miami Beach, and then I'm going to go over here this away, right? So we do have, there is variance. And so the National Hurricane Center takes all these models. Uh, and some of them are our models, some of them are from other parts of the world, and we, we put those together from, from different research outfits, and we create this. So this is, this is the, the cone model. And this is typically what you'll see in the newspaper, this is typically what you'll see in the, in the, the TV reporting or something of that nature. And so this will be generated. This is generated at this point in time. So here is the, the, the date, time, hour it was generated. And then we have a series of five uh, circles that are generating the so-called cone of, of uncertainty. So we're starting here, boom, 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 and we're going. And this is one day out. The second circle is two days out, three days, four days, and five days, okay? Um, uh, in this case, uh, being illustrated, the, the, um, the spaghetti diagrams are, are dotted underneath just for illustration purposes here. So what, what we're showing is the um, likelihood that um, uh, uh, likelihood of the path of the storm. And so this is the central uh, part of the predictions, okay? Um, now, they get bigger because we're pretty good at predicting today. We're pretty good at predicting what's going to be tomorrow. But as we go two days out, there's a little more noise. As we go three days out, a little more noise. So as we go each day further, the cone of uncertainty grows. The, the diameter of the circle grows. And, um, and 
unfortunately, people sometimes look at this and they misread this. So they'll look at this and they'll say, um, this is where the hurricane's going to go. And this is the, the um, uh, area of the hurricane impact. That's not true. This is the path of the storm. And the, the eye, the center of the storm, can be anywhere uh, in this circle. So this does not mean the extent. This means the center of the storm. And so, uh, so this area here, this, this uh, beige area, is potentially direct impacts of that storm, major rainfall, storm surge, et cetera. And so, uh, so that's, uh, historically, this is where we left it. So historically, we, we, we generated this, the National Hurricane Center said, here you go. In recent years, we've been doing much more with very fine scale prediction of, of not just taking this, but then, because this is very coarse, very large scale, uh, you know, global atmospheric modeling stuff is down sampling this to actually give much more detailed uh, uh, predictions for things like storm surge, et cetera, wind speed, et cetera, for different communities along the coast potentially affected. And so that's been a huge advancement. One thing I think I forgot to say, let me go back here. I think I forgot to say this. It, it, hopefully it makes sense, but um, there is the, I didn't, when I was doing the diagram here, I didn't talk about the eye of the storm. So the eye of the hurricane, the center part of the hurricane, is um, totally uh, counterintuitively perhaps calm. So out here we have all this cra these crazy winds, we have this intense dumping of rain, it's, it's hard to hear, it hurts your ears a lot of times, the pressure is so low, and it's, it's you know, all those things we saw with storm surge and, and, and impacts, etc. Um, because of the cyclonic nature, at the center of this um, typhoon, basically, the center of this, this tornado type structure, um, it is clear. There are no clouds. So if you look above right here, you can't see the sky because it's all raindrops in your eyeballs and, and thick clouds, gray, dark. Here, it's bright sunlight and uh, no wind. So the eye of the storm is this ironically super calm thing. So you'll, and so this is where we get the phrase, the eye of the storm, so, or it's calm in the eye of the storm. So all this is noisy, chaos, danger, blah, 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 you get here and it's mellow. And then as the storm blows over you, you get, go back through the eye wall and back into the chaos of the storm and the, the elevated water and all that, all that kind of stuff. So just to finish this part here before we uh, come up to our next break, um, uh, I'll just say that uh, this has gotten a lot, this got a lot of attention and caused all kinds of controversy, et cetera, um, in recent years um, with so-called Sharpie Gate. So this was where the president um, um, implied that uh, folks in one part of the country were vulnerable to a hurricane when it was not predicted to go there. So essentially, um, someone took a Sharpie and drew, and this was in a national, you know, this was a meeting with the National Press Corps. Uh, so here is, you see this, here's our code of uncertainty. So we know this, right? We can see this, here we go. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. And this is, un, we're unclear here, right? So this is, the, the code of uncertainty goes for five days, but because this, in this case, it had not, uh, was not predicted to hit landfall in the US yet, um, the idea was we, we, add, we added an additional um, bubble here as to when it might reach landfall, which is typical. Uh, but what is, what is and, and that's the official result. Unfortunately, the administration at the time decided that for political reasons, they wanted to say that these people were in danger and that they were being heroic and they would help them. And so someone literally pulled out a Sharpie and drew a bubble on on that and, and said, it's also gonna keep going that way. There was no data to support that. This led to this huge falling out, people losing their jobs because folks from the National Weather Service said that was wrong. That was not accurate. That was not correct data that should not have been presented. And then political people didn't like to hear that. And so then there was things that ensued. This is so-called Sharpie gate. Um, but just to be clear, this was, this was, um, a lie. This was not based on data. This was a political um, uh, endeavor. 
Uh, so we'll just we'll just pause this section here with um, with with a picture of Hurricane Katrina. Um, real important here to understand that hurricanes can be devastating. Tropical storms can be devastating. It doesn't matter um, uh, the exact intensity if you are the one that, that is experiencing this. But I also just wanted to note here that this, this is when Hurricane Katrina was a category five storm, which again is the strongest category. When it would go on to make landfall, it would only be a category three. By the time it strikes New Orleans, it's only a category one. Um, but nevertheless, check it out. We see here at this point on August 28th, um, we, again, we can see the, the structure here. We can see the eye, the calm center. We see these cyclonic twisting bands, right? Counterclockwise spinning. Uh, and we can see that these bands of moisture and, and impact, they're hitting everything from the Yucatan to Florida to Texas. I mean, check it out. The storm is massive. The storm is in and of itself, um, it's, it's just taking up a large chunk of the Gulf of Mexico. And so, so uh, how these storms present, the scale at which they present are, again, increasingly, uh, we're realizing how important this is to get a handle on, not just on the, the intensity, as important as the storm surge and the winds are, the scale at which these entities are operating is huge. If, for example, we have staged our rescue people over here, and as big storm is impacting this whole region, we might be screwed, right? Whereas if this was a much tighter storm and a much narrower storm, it might make more sense to stage our rescue folks over here because then they would be by and large out of harm's way and could get in more rapidly to assist folks in the wake of the landfall of the storm. Um, okay, so I think I'll, I'll pause there. So that was my sort of intro to how we get hurricanes and how they form. Does that make sense? Do you guys have any questions about formation of hurricanes and, and the conditions that we need to form a hurricane? Not really the formation, but on one of the slides uh, said hurricanes have a higher probability since like 1950 with X, or 1975 with exception to 97, oh. 2002 El Nino. And I was uh, just wondering why El Nino's after that uh, weren't also exceptions. Uh, it, uh, intensity of the El Ninos. So a mile, so on the El Ninos range, I'm, I'm not entirely sure to answer the question. I believe what the answer is, is intensity of the El Nino. So 97 was an incredibly powerful El Nino year. Um, I think 97 was the year that the kelp beds, I, well, I could be wrong, I think, I think 97 was the year that the La Jolla kelp beds in San Diego there was those, the, the storms were so intense, they scoured one inch off of the rocky reef uh, uh, 10 meters down. So that was a, that was a really intense um, El Nino season. And so, so I, think, I think it's these intense years of El Nino. So it's not just that it was an El Nino, but that it was a strong El Nino year, I believe. Good, other questions? Um, I, I had a quick, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Caitlin, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just um, so obviously you said that hurricanes need like really warm water to start. Um, how long like do they as they continue to move across the globe, do they need that warm water to keep going or like how long do they need that? Will they just like die off if they hit cold water or? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so, so if they were to hit, a, if we were to somehow magically um, have a, let's see. Um, if we were to somehow magically have a refrigerator right here, um, that would that would calm them down. And so, so um, yes, so so it's going to be directly tied to that condition. Either either the sea surface water temperature um, decreases, or the depth at which that that uh, heat goes. Either of those changes will start to weaken the storm. Okay. So that's all. I mean, ultimately, that's why hurricanes weaken in strength when they hit land is because they're essentially cut off from that water. So obviously if it's, if it's over ocean water, it's not gonna be as cut off as, as it was over land, but an, an analogy is, this, is the same. It, um, they need that fuel. As soon as we cut off that fuel, it starts to taper. And so, so while we can get 
intense rainfall, say up here in New York or in Ohio or something, um, as these as these hurricanes dissipate, it's just rain. You know, it's not these intense spinning storms that knock down trees and things of that nature. So yeah, okay. good question. Good question. Thank you. Oh, somebody else had a question. Um, yeah, so we talked about the Coriolis effect and how it's a perceived force rather than an actual one. So mm -hmm. um, how does that work? It, it was in the list of ingredients of a, for, for a hurricane. So how does that work if it's a perceived force and not a real one? Oh, it works because we're spinning underneath. So so it works because, where's my thing? Can I have a thing here? Yeah, it works because um, you and I are, uh, are, affixed to this merry-go-round and so uh, and so that's why these winds essentially blow parallel at the equator here and so so they're blowing parallel to the equator and they're sort of coming up this way zhuk, zhuk. and so um uh that's what's going to um uh make the spinning that's what's going to make it spin basically so how do i explain this so so you and i are stuck on this um are stuck on this dune here in the sahara or something right and so as we move around the air is so the air is moving from um uh low pressure to high pressure it, it's filling in and and we're going to spin out from underneath it so I don't know if I'm explaining myself, but 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 so it's going to act a curve. Maybe I'm, yeah, I, I guess I, I need I need to think of a, a clearer explanation. But um, um, that's going to that's going to help make the the Coriolis effect is going to in effect make the air not flow in what appears to be a straight line, and so that's going to help it spin. And help it make a defined um, chunk of atmosphere. I don't think I'm explaining it well. That makes sense. Okay. You're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, maybe I should. I'll look up see if I can find a better maybe illustration or visualization or, or video. Um, Other questions you guys have about any of that? I a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, due to climate change and all that, um, I know global um, ocean temperature is rising has there been hurricanes that we've not been expecting there to be hurricanes like like for example i know for example hurricanes can form in the arctic because it's just too cold is there like but um like near as you um has earthquakes been happening more northern than ever recorded or no has there not been proven that so far excuse me um so the answer is, uh, so there's two parts there. So one is, let's see, do I have a map? Uh, yeah, so, um, so one of the questions is, okay, climate change, are we seeing the um, territory of hurricanes or the, or the zone of influence of hurricanes increase? I don't know if we've quite seen that yet, but that's one of the predictions. In, in sort of two ways. One, as the as water tends to warm up a little bit, that means there's more fuel, and the fuel is is sort of less concentrated in these in these more tropical latitudes, and it's it's expanding slightly into the more temperate regions. So one, it's because of that. Two, it's the the intensity of the hurricanes are such that you can imagine if it's a weak hurricane and it's kind of like this. And then it kind of it peters out, right? Whereas if it's really strong, it's going to it's going to you know tend to persist longer, right? It's going to have more inertia, more momentum to continue on. So both those things are at play. Whether we've seen a latitudinal, an, on average, a latitudinal increase, I don't know if that's happened or not yet. Um, but certainly that is predicted. Um, so, for example, I, one of the historic or one of the, the co consequential hurricane things I almost put in, I didn't because I didn't think it was that consequential, but for us, it might be consequential. Point Magoo, the naval, where we now have the naval uh, uh, air, or, uh, naval base Ventura County, 
Uh, the name has changed so, so many times since I've been working there. Um, uh, now called Naval Base Ventura County. Um, we used to have a fishing pier there. There used to be a pier that went straight off um, and, and was open to the public. People would drive up from LA to, to go um, you know, fish that, that uh, Saturday or whatever. People come down from Ventura, super popular, big wooden pier. Destroyed by the remnants of a hurricane in 1923. So you and I can't go fish now out there because of one of these hurricanes. Now, we don't typically have hurricanes hitting us or we don't typically have a, a um, consolidated storm, the tropical storm that was a hurricane hit us, but we did in 1923. And the predictions are as we go into the future, we're gonna see more of that type of activity. So more of this sort of you know, sloppy overshot um, type situation for hurricanes. Um, in general, the question I think maybe Ollie's asking here is, is what is <clears throat> climate change going to do to hurricanes? And um, that has been a bit of a, of a controversial um, topic. But this is really one of the centers uh, or, or focuses of um, uh, what's known as attribution science. 15 years ago, this wasn't really super rigorous. In the last decade or so, it's gotten extremely rigorous. And you guys can go to graduate school, for example, and just focus on attribution science. And that is because, um, again, uh, we have weather and then we have climate. Weather is the actual uh, the event, the, the occurrence, the thing that you and I perceive. Climate, recall, is the long-term average of all those <clears throat> individual events. And so while it's pretty clear what's going on with the climate, any one individual thing today or yesterday, it's hard to say that was totally caused by climate change. But in the last few years, we've gotten much better at trying to say, <clears throat> what was the likelihood that we would have had this strong a hurricane, say, at this time of year in this location? And, and uh, those, those types of things. And what we're finding is that there's, we're building, there's, there's still debate, there's still, still evolving, but we're building stronger and stronger evidence to see the fingerprints of climate change in these disasters, be that a wildfire, be that a hurricane, et cetera. And so, um, what I, I mean, we haven't talked about Hurricane Katrina yet, um, but what I always talk about with, with Hurricane Katrina is um, almost assuredly Hurricane Katrina was um, contribute or, or was made um, more problematic due to climate change. And I, I feel very confident in saying if we had not been pumping out another, you know, all, all, all the gazillions of metric tons of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases for the last 150 years, I don't think Hurricane Katrina would be as, it wouldn't have been as destructive as it, as it was. Regardless, it doesn't matter because Hurricane Katrina is it was, and it's, it's now been proven in the years since, to be um, an example of what we're going to see more frequently. So these storms are going to come more frequently, and the ones that do come are going to be more intense. And the, and the research now is, 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 you know, how much more intense, how much more frequent. But, it, you know, again, as we talked about, all these ingredients, they're, they're almost assuredly going to make things worse. Now, there are additional uh, 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 compounding factors and complicating things. Some research shows that we have these really intense storm events, let's say over the Sahara, sometimes that dust blowing off of Africa actually helps to inhibit. Um, you know, so a little bit of dust maybe might help start the, the hurricanes, but a lot might actually make it harder to form having to do with moisture and things of that nature. So, so there are clearly some feedback loops that we don't fully understand and we're still figuring this out. But um, the, the consensus absolutely is that hurricanes will become more frequent and or intense, um, at least major hurricanes. And we will see, and, and, and of that spectrum, tropical storm, hurricane, 
uh, major hurricane, we're going to see things that maybe were, uh, you know, we, you know, a tropical storm is going to be more likely to be a hurricane. A hurricane is going to be more likely to be a tropical storm, that type of stuff. So, um, so yeah, Ali, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Okay, cool. Cool. Any other questions before we take our, take a break? Okay, cool. Let's take a, a 10 minute break and I'll see you guys back in, in a few minutes. <laughs> 